Thank you, everyone uh, who is listening now will listen subsequently. Um, what I will do today, um, in many ways, I will give you a gist of uh, the book that I wrote, Anatomy of a Genocide, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach. But in the book, I didn't really uh, um, theorize what I'm doing. Uh, and here you will have more of that. So in some ways, this uh, is not simply a summary of the book, but rather an attempt to think through uh, many of the issues that the book raises, and then a series of conclusions from that uh, research. So as usual, I will share a PowerPoint with you. And... Oh, but I'm in the wrong place on that PowerPoint. So let me go back to the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, good to see you again, so to speak. Um, I began uh, thinking about this book uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, although the book, uh, as you may know, came out in uh, 2018. Uh, at the time, the disintegration of the communist system uh, was initially uh, presented by some observers, as some of the older people here will remember, as the end of history. Uh, but such assertions were quickly followed by two genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda, in which people were often killed uh, by their own neighbors. Ironically, it was during that same decade that the Holocaust uh, came to be recognized by the international community as a major event in World War II and indeed in the history of the 20th century. And we tend to forget that that was not always the way or the place of the Holocaust in historiography in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. It was quite marginal to historical research, uh, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, yet the, the conventional understanding of the Holocaust at the time set it apart from other genocides, presenting it as a highly organized undertaking of industrial murder, which succeeded in distancing the killers from their victims and compartmentalized the process of extermination in a manner that left little room for either responsibility or choice. The intimate nature of the violence in Bosnia and Rwanda and the sense that the prevailing representation of the Holocaust had largely taken the perpetrators off the hook by making them into mere pawns in a vast impersonal machine caused me to rethink the reigning paradigms of Holocaust historiography. That is, decision-making at the top and the incremental and the incremental implementation of a highly bureaucratized continent-wide genocide. Instead, I wanted to find out whether there had in fact been an encounter between the perpetrators and their victims, and if so, what was its nature? Was there a degree of mutual recognition of a shared humanity, and if so, how did it affect the contours of the event as a whole. At the time, oh, one sec. At the time, it was already known that about half of the victims of the Holocaust had not been killed in extermination camps. Indeed, as it turned out, a vast majority of those victims were murdered where they lived, in their own synagogues and cemeteries, parks and streets, or in nearby woods and ravines. But research on such killings told us precious little on any significant contact between the killers and the victims before the slaughter began. So in order to investigate this question, I chose to closely examine how these events unfolded in Buchach a fairly characteristic town in Eastern Europe, where the majority of the Jews had lived before the war and where most of them, this thing keeps turning on its own, sorry, and where most of them were murdered. 
I knew Buchach as the birthplace and literary focus of the Hebrew language author and Nobel Prize laureate Shmuel Yosef Agnon. It was also the hometown of Immanuel Ringenblum, the renowned historian and founder of the Warsaw Ghetto's Oinek Shabbos archive and of the Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal. And it was where my mother spent the first years of her life before emigrating to Palestine in 1935 with her parents and two brothers. None of the rest of my family that remained in the region survived the Holocaust. In 1995, I interviewed my mother about her childhood. What struck me in that account was that she had little to say about anti-Semitism, fear, or animosity. She grew up speaking Yiddish at home, studying at the local Polish public school, and playing with Ukrainians. She had fond memories of picking wild berries and mushrooms in the forest. It was a good childhood, which ended, in fact, as soon as she arrived in Palestine at the age of 11. My mother's story indicated that when thinking about the encounter between the perpetrators and the victims, I had left out the impact of inter-ethnic relations on local genocides. It meant that I needed to go back further in time to understand how communities of ethnic and religious coexistence were transformed into communities of fraternal violence. Now, Buchac numbered about 15,000 people on the eve of World War II, made up of Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians. These three groups had lived side by side in this region since the 16th century. Initially, Buchac was a private town owned by the noble Buchatsky family, and in the early 16th century, it became the property of the powerful Pototsky clan. The fortress served as one of a chain of borderland strongholds to ward off invasions from east and south. Indeed, the Bu- indeed uh, Buchach was devastated during the Cossack uprising of 1648 and was sacked in 1676 by the Ottoman army. But in the 18th century, the town flourished. Many of its most outstanding edifices were built at that time, including its splendid Baroque City Hall, the Greek Catholic Basilian Monastery, the remodeled Roman Catholic Church, and the massive Great Synagogue. But meanwhile, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, of which Buczać was part, crumbled. In 1772, the Habsburg Empire annexed the kingdom's southern territories and renamed them Galicia. This remained the empire's poorest province, also containing its largest concentration of Jews. While Polish aristocracy maintained its influence, eastern Galicia, where Buczać was located, retained the majority Ukrainian population. By the 1880s, Jews constituted two-thirds of the city's residents, stabilizing at about 50% by 1914. Poles made up the city's second largest group, whereas the countryside had a majority Ukrainian population. With the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the end of World War I, Galicia was now taken over again by a resurrected Poland but its population remained majority Ukrainian, and its towns were densely populated by Jews. This means that for many generations, the only reality known to the people of the region was one of an ethnically mixed society. Throughout this period, each group preserved and transformed its unique customs, religion, language, and often socioeconomic niche. But at the same time, there was always lively 
At the same time, there was always lively social and economic interaction between the groups. People often spoke each other's languages and made acquaintances, business partners, and friends across ethno-religious lines. This was not a pluralistic society. Most people adhered strongly to their religious and ethnic identities and preserved diff different and at times antagonistic collective memories. There was always a degree of socioeconomic envy and resentment, as well as religious prejudice. Tellingly, despite the numerous intermarriages between Roman Catholic Poles and Greek Catholic Ukrainians, the sons of such unions traditionally follow the father's religion, while the daughters follow the mothers, thereby perpetuating ethno-religious differences within families over generations. Nonetheless, the two centuries between the Ottoman wars of the 17th century and World War I, Eastern Galicia experienced very little communal violence. Why then did these same groups perpetrate such extreme violence on each other in World War II? In part, the violence must be attributed to external invaders. But inter-ethnic violence in the region began long before World War II and the Holocaust, and its seeds were sown decades earlier. Indeed, the most direct roots of violence in Galicia can be traced to the rise of nationalism in the region in the second half of the 19th century which was often grafted onto previous religious and ethnic affinities and animosities. As nationalism gained supporters among the masses, people increasingly asked who, belonged, who belongs to this land and who does not, or who does the land belong to and who is an alien, a colonizer, or an invader. The Polish nationalist narrative popularly articulated by Nobel Prize laureate Henryk Sienkiewicz in his 1884 novel By Fire and Sword, tells of benevolent Polish noblemen <clears throat> who had come to the wide lands of the East to civilize and bring prosperity to their primitive inhabitants and to ward off invasions by savage Cossacks, Tatars, and Turks. Polish nationalists depicted the mostly rural Greek Catholic Catholics of Galicia as ethnic brethren who would eventually become part of the Polish nation. But as Ukrainian nationalists saw things, the Polish landlords and their Jewish lackeys had colonized, oppressed, and exploited the indigenous Ukrainian population. The popular Ukrainian Galician author, Ivan Franko, dedicated many of his works to describing Ukrainian villages as the victims of Polish arrogance and Jewish greed and machinations. The only issue on which Polish and Ukrainian nationalists agreed was that their future nation states, the Jews would have no place. Jewish nationalism was largely a response to this exclusionary discourse. But Galician Zionism also borrowed, uh, sorry, this keeps uh, flipping, but Galician Zionism also borrowed its counterpart's notion of an ethno-nationalism, which eventually, which it eventually exported to Eretz Israel. The eventual struggle of Zionism with the indigenous inhabitants of Palestine was thus an extension and a reversal of this East European conceptualization of nationalism. Uh, and that's an, a, a very interesting issue that one can talk about in a different context. But in Galicia, the mutually antagonistic nationalist rhetoric did not generally translate into physical violence before World War I. 
largely thanks to the empire's success in balancing one group against another. World War I violently put an end to the old order. The tremendous violence of the fighting and the massive destruction of property were accompanied by extensive population displacement and numerous instances of cruelty and brutality against civilians. Especially targeted were the Jews, who came under Russian occupation, as occurred twice in Buchach, when Cossack units killed, raped, maimed, robbed, and humiliated the Jewish inhabitants in full view of their Christian neighbors. Many Galician, Polish, and Ukrainian recruits to the multi-ethnic Austro-Hungarian army had little loyalty to the empire. They were fighting for the creation of their own future nation-states. Only the Jews were still known as Kaisertoy, or loyal to the emperor, because they feared their fate where the empire were to collapse. For their Polish and Ukrainian neighbors, this attitude was seen as either sliding, um, siding with their enemies or gutlessly evading the fighting altogether, despite plentiful evidence of Jewish sacrifice for the empire. With Austrian defeat in 1918, Poles and Ukrainians turned on each other in a brutal war over the territory of Galicia, replete with many massacres of civilians, including several pogroms against local Jews. By 1919, the Polish victory put an end to the Ukrainian gambit to create an independent state, and Galicia became part of independent Poland. These six years of extreme violence filled the hearts of Galicia's inhabitants with terror, fear, and resentment. The unfulfilled Polish promises to grant Ukrainian autonomy further fueled the conflict between these two groups. And the memories of wartime horrors remain seared in the minds of the youths who would become the activists and fighters of the 1930s and 1940s. Polish attempts to colonize Eastern Poland by providing preferential treatment to settlers from the heartland of the country further heightened local tensions. And efforts to promote Ukrainian national identity in schools, reading clubs, and patriotic associations were severely repressed by the Polish state. All this led to the establishment in 1929 of the underground terrorist organization of Ukrainian nationalists, known by its acronym OUN, dedicated to the creation of a Pole-free and Jew-free independent Ukraine. Interwar OUN activists in Buchach resurfaced as administration and police members under the German occupation in summer 1941. The Jewish population of Buchach only partly recovered from the devastation of World War I and was further impoverished during the Great Depression. In the 1930s, Ukrainian nationalist boycotts of Jewish businesses and growing police, Polish state anti-Semitism, especially in the second half of the decade, greatly exacerbated the sense of crisis in the Jewish community. Yet restrictions on immigration to the United States, Western Europe, and Palestine made it all the more difficult to leave. Some young, mostly working class Jewish men and women turned to communism, but failed to find any adherents among the rest of the population. A few of those who survived formed small resistance groups during the German occupation, but most of them were killed before, before the end of the war. On September 17th, 1939, just two weeks after the Germans invaded Poland from the West, the Red Army 
marched into Galicia. Initially, many Ukrainians greeted the Soviets as liberators from Polish oppression, and many Jews were relieved not to have come under German Nazi rule. The Soviets nationalized the economy, thereby causing severe food shortages. They organized fraudulent elections to create the impression of public support for the annexation. And they launched a campaign of deportations, incarcerations, and executions of their real and imaginary opponents. The first wave targeted mostly the Polish elites. The second included Jewish Zionists and business owners. And the third included mass arrests of Ukrainian nationalists. In retrospect, while Poles and Ukrainians record their respective deportations as national tragedies, Jews perceived them as inadvertent rescue from far worse faith under Hitler. Importantly, although disproportionately Jews were more likely to be deported, their Christian neighbors blamed alleged Jewish collaboration with the authorities for their own deportations. As the Red Army retreated from Galicia in the face of the German invasion in late June 1941, the NKVD, the Soviet secret police, executed thousands of Ukrainian activists incarcerated in local jails. This led to mass violence throughout Galicia even before the Germans arrived, perpetrated by local Ukrainian nationalists and rabble against Jewish citizens accused of precipitating these executions. The Germans at first encouraged and participated in the violence before casting it in their own systematic mold. In Buchach, as soon as the Soviets left, a Ukrainian siege or militia was formed, numbering about 100 men and commanded by pre-war nationalist activists. The militia unleashed a series of reprisal actions against former Soviet administrators, as well as widespread anti-Jewish violence. Ukrainian leaders hoped that the Germans would allow Ukrainian autonomy and eventual independence. But while Hitler had no intention of allowing a Ukrainian state, German authorities on the ground effectively enlisted local support in implementing their policy of removing the Jews, which ne neatly coincided with the agenda of the Oun. The Germans arrived in Buchach on July 5th, 1941. Soon thereafter, they converted the local siege into an auxiliary police unit, eventually creating a battalion of over 300 men whose main goal was to assist them in carrying out the mass murder of the local Jewish population. In August, the so-called Jewish intelligentsia of Buchach about 450 mostly male professionals were led to the nearby Fedor Hill and shot by a German security police, Sicherheitspolizei or Zippo force from Tarnopol, assisted by the local Ukrainian police. The following month, a new Zippo outpost was established in the nearby town of Chortkov whose task was to exterminate the entire Jewish population in the region. The outposts numbered about 20 Gestapo, criminal police, and SS men, including several ethnic Germans from Lithuania and Czechoslovakia. Assisted by the Ukrainian Auxiliary Police Battalion, with local detachments of uniformed German gendarmerie, Ukrainian police, and Jewish police, known as the Ordnungsdienst, or OD, this outpost murdered approximately 60,000 Jews in the Chotkov buchach area, mostly between August 1942 and June 1943. About half of the victims 
were loaded onto trains in brutal roundups, during which hundreds were shot on the streets and transported to the Berget's extermination camp, where they were gassed. Once this camp shut down in late 1942, the rest of the victims were shot in or near their towns. In Buchach, burial pits were dug on the Fedor Hill and on the Bashti Hill, the site of the Jewish cemetery, located on either sides of the town and a brief walk from the main square, well within earshot of the inhabitants. This was the pattern of the murder of all 500,000 Jews in Galicia, approximately half of whom were shot where they lived. When the German Zippo personnel and local Bucha gendarmes were not killing the Jews, they were having a very good time. Living in bucolic settings without any danger to their personal security and enjoying unlimited access to food, alcohol, tobacco, and sex, they had absolute power over life and death and were only loosely controlled by their superiors in Lemberg. Not only could they act as they pleased, at times they also brought their family members, wives, children, even parents, as well as mistresses, to share with them the pleasures of genocidal colonial rule. And recall that period even decades later, when some of them were eventually brought to trial as the best time of their lives. The Germans also got to know their victims, often intimately, before they murdered them. Since the bulk of the killing was done, sorry, began only a year after their arrival, in the meantime, they used the Jews not merely as forced labor in such projects as road construction, but also as their maids, babysitters, barbers, tailors, and sec secretaries, and so forth. They knew many of the Jews by name, just as the few Jews who survived remember them. Other Germans in Buchach, such as the local civilian administrators, train and postal officials, engineers and foremen, brought there to repair the train bridge and tunnel blown up by the retreating Soviets, as well as these men's wives, similarly became acquainted with the Jewish population. At times, they even befriended them, but also partook of the property left behind by those who were murdered. And in some cases, they either observed the killings or participated in them. The Germans had also numerous contacts with the non-Jewish population, civil servants, doctors, policemen, lovers, or friends. It was, as many record, a lively social scene, even as regular roundups and mass killings were occurring right under people's windows. In Buchach, approximately 10,000 Jews from the town and surrounding communities were killed, over half of them in situ, between October 1942 and June 1943, at which point the city was declared Judenfrei, or free of Jews. The remaining Jews, some who were hiding with villagers, while others were employed in agricultural labor camps, were mostly killed in the period leading to the takeover of Buchach by the Red Army in March 1944. Large numbers of them were murdered by their own putative rescuers or denounced and killed by the Germans or most commonly by the Ukrainian police. Still, when the Soviets arrived, some 800 Jews came out of hiding, a relatively high number. This is attributed in part to less vehement anti-Semitism among the peasants in the Buchach area and the greater willingness of some Polish villagers to help Jews. It may also be related to the attacks by local Jewish resistance groups on several professional denouncers, 
which succeeded in intimidating those who hoped to make a profitable business from handing Jews over to the Germans. But in April 1944, the Red Army made a tactical retreat from Buchach, and most of the surviving Jews, too weak to escape and unable to return to their exposed shelters, were murdered. By the time the Soviets returned, for good, in July 1944, fewer than 100 Jews out of a pre-war population of 8,000 were still alive in the city and its vicinity. In reconstructing the normalization and routinization of genocide on the local level, one must make ample use of first-person, most often Jewish accounts. Such testimonies often have little to say about the Germans and repeatedly refer to the choices made by Christian neighbors and villagers. To be sure, considering the unrelenting determination of the Germans to exterminate the Jews, choices were limited. And yet for those who survived, they made the difference between life and death. Most Jewish survivors owed their lives to a neighbor, an acquaintance, or an unknown villager who offered them shelter or even just handed them some bread and milk. Conversely, not a few Christians who took Jews in for pay, whether to buy them uh, food or to enrich themselves, ended up betraying them when the Jews ran out of money or when the putative rescuers grew impatient to land their hands on Jewish property, or because they feared that their neighbors, who resented them for profiting from their Jews, were about to denounce them. In rare instances, even Germans saved Jews. One remarkable Wehrmacht officer protected about 600 Jews from local bandits, raiding villages, and disbanded military units in the nearby town of Tuste during the last weeks of the German occupation, keeping his promise to stay until merely a few hours before the Red Army marched in. We know of his heroic act only from accounts by the Jews he saved. The killing in the region did not end with the murder of the Jews. As German rule in the region began to disintegrate, units of the radical faction of their own known as Banderites, Banderivtsi or Banderovtsi, after the name of their leader, Stepan Bandera, along with the newly formed Ukrainian insurgent army, or UPA, which had already been engaged in ethnic cleansing, in an ethnic cleansing campaign of Polish population in the nearby province of Volhynia, crossed over to Galicia in early 1944 and set about massacring entire Polish communities. The underground Polish Home Army and other armed peasant battalions in the region responded in kind, and a brutal civil war between the two groups ensued. The Germans paid scant attention to these mutual massacres as long as they did not interfere with their own operations. And in some cases, actually helped Polish civilians escape to the West. The fighting continued beyond the return of the Red Army, and the Oun UPA also engaged in a bitter insurgency against the Soviets, brutally suppressed by the NKVD, which deported thousands of insurgents and their families to gulags and settlements in Siberia and Central Asia. By then, the population exchange agreed between the USSR and the communist authorities in Poland ensured that Galicia was entirely emptied of its remaining Polish inhabitants. For the first time in recorded uh, history, the centuries-old multi-ethnic region had finally been transformed through genocide, ethnic cleansing, deportations, and population policies into a purely Ukrainian land. Ironically, the goal of Ukrainian nationalists 
going back to the late 19th century had been accomplished through the combined policies of the region's German and Soviet occupiers. For the next four decades, the pre-war and wartime history of Buchach, as that of Eastern Galicia as a whole, was thoroughly distorted and largely erased. Under Soviet rule, there was no room to speak of the particular horror of the extermination of the Jews, nor of the collaboration of much of the Ukrainian population, whereas the anti-Soviet insurgency was presented as the work of a few bad apples. A local guidebook uh, for Buchach merely commented that 7,000 innocent Soviet citizens were murdered there by the Hitlerites, insisting that the population as a whole never submitted to their hated rule. Once Ukraine gained independence in 1991, a new version of events emerged. Now, the OUN and the UPA, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, were presented as national heroes who continued the task first taken up by Bogdan Khmelnytsky in 1648 to liberate their land from foreign oppression. Statues of Stepan Bandera sprouted everywhere. Conversely, in provincial towns such as Buchach, no mention was made of the murder of their own Jews or of the fact that before the war, at least half of the population was Jewish. Even in the local high school, in the gymnasium, where Ringeblum and Wiesenthal had once studied, the town's Jewish past remained unmentioned. And while the Roman Catholic Church has now been beautifully restored, the single remaining Jewish edifice in Buchach, the study house, was bulldozed in 2001 to make room for a shopping center. No signs have been put up to mark the sites of the mass graves surrounding the town. Somewhat more optimistically, on the initiative of several young people in the town, a bust of Agnon has been put up and a literary center was created on the street named after him, where he's thought to have lived in his childhood. What the local Ukrainian population remembers of those years of war and occupation is a saga of oppression and bitter struggle for liberation. Ukrainians speak of themselves as victims of the interwar Polish regime, as the principal target of Soviet repression in 1939-41, of being robbed and being sent to forced labor in the Reich by the Germans, and of suffering for many years in gulags and deportation after the failed post-war insurgency. What they prefer to forget are the numerous Ukrainian policemen who facilitated the roundups and mass executions of their Jewish neighbors. Even those who recalled their Jewish friends with sympathy and sorrow insisted that local Poles and Ukrainians only tried to help them however they could. Such types as Volodymyr Kaznovsky, a former district attorney turned police, office, uh, police chief under the Germans, have been erased from the local collective memory. Instead, Fedor Hill, where thousands of Jewish victims are buried, is adorned by a large memorial to the heroes and martyrs of the struggle for Ukrainian liberation, while a statue of Bandera looks down on the city from another hill. What can be learned about the Holocaust as a whole, and genocide more generally, from the study of the deep roots of inter-ethnic coexistence and the particular manner in which genocide unfolded in Buchach under German rule. Let me offer some concluding thoughts on the value of such local studies of genocide. First, research on Buchach serves as a corrective to the understanding of the Holocaust 
as largely carried out in a detached manner, whereby the encounter between perpetrators and victims was greatly limited. On the local level, in hundreds of towns such as Buchach, that was hardly the case. Indeed, the genocidal encounter between killers and their targets was intimate rather than detached, because the victims had become known to the perpetrators for many months before they were killed. Second, the perception that much of the killing took place in secret, remote, and well-concealed extermination camps is refuted by the finding that in such cases as Buchach, the roundups were public, watched by the entire local population and the German civilians in the town. Even trained deportations were accompanied by extreme brutality, and hundreds were shot on the street. The, killing, the killings in situ occurred within everyone's earshot and were watched by many residents and German civilians, some of whom deliberately walked up to the pits out of sheer curiosity, as they subsequently testified. Third, the category of bystanders is largely emptied of meaning in such cases of local genocide. In these small towns, no one simply stood by. Rather, there were only degrees of engagement, ranging from total collaboration in the killing to altruistic rescue. Most people were somewhere in between and often moved along the scale depending on the circumstances. People might take over the property of friends and neighbors killed in front of their eyes simply because otherwise someone else would appropriate it. Once they did so, they became part of the profit-making enterprise the genocide invariably is. Fourth, local genocide exposes the ambiguity of goodness, whereby survival depends on help from one's neighbors, just as it was usually neighbors or even the rescuers themselves who were most likely to denounce those in hiding. Sheltering Jews was dangerous and expensive, but could also bring in a nice profit, as well as allow for labor and sexual exploitation. The Germans often depended on locals to identify Jews, discover their hideouts, or go and go into the woods to kill them. Yet almost all Jews who survived were rescued by Christian acquaintances or strangers, in some cases by extremely poor peasants. Fifth, in examining the long durée of local violence, we find that those who were or perceived themselves as being victimized under one set of circumstances could swiftly become the perpetrators of violence under other conditions. Local Poles and Ukrainians related differently to changing rulers, but locally attributed much of their suffering to the other group, whose members they often knew intimately. Yet both groups tended to see the Jews as siding with the other, as well as with external forces. At the same time, they denied participation in the mass murder of the Jews and occasionally suggested that the victims had responded to their own genocide so passively because they perceived it as expiation for their past sins. For Jews, uh, the Jews, for their part, spoke after the event of their neighbors as being, quote, worse than the Germans, not because they actually were, but because of a deep sense of betrayal by their fellow townsmen. It was this kind of reasoning that motivated the Banderites to massacre Poles and Jews and led Poles and the few remaining Jews to join Soviet extermination battalions charged with eradicating the Ukrainian insurgency. Sixth, and following from the previous point, we can conclude that the local dynamics and relations between these groups largely determine the nature, perception, 
and memory of the events of World War II. Not only did each group see itself as the other group's victim, but there was also a widespread sense that any other group's relative success had come at the expense of one's own people. This was an old sentiment which bred growing resentment and rage. It is also for this reason that in studying local genocide, one must begin long before violence was unleashed and trace the process whereby inter-ethnic coexistence began to fray and transform into mutual fear, hostility, and rage. Seventh, the study of local genocide can only be comprehensive by making full use of all available personal accounts in the form of diaries, letters, testimonies, courtroom records, interviews, and memoirs. Such first-person evidence, when effectively woven together with other documentary records, makes it possible to create a nuanced, complex, three-dimensional picture of an event that is often described and remembered only through a partisan lens by the protagonist, and is just as often depicted by historians largely from the perspective of the perpetrator's far neater, but hardly more objective, archival documents. Eight, these first-person narratives also teach us that the terminology we take at face value has different meanings for each group of historical protagonists. Such terms as collaboration and liberation are a good example. What Christians saw as Jewish collaboration with the Soviets was perceived by Jews as the chance to participate for the first time in the state apparatus, become policemen, carry arms, attend secondary schools. What Jews saw as Ukrainian collaboration with the Germans, Ukrainians saw as the hitherto denied opportunity to work toward an independent Ukraine. What Jews saw as liberation by the Red Army in 1944, Ukrainians saw as reoccupation. Jewish survivors perceived Red Army officers as a veritable, and Jewish Red Army officers as a veritable miracle. Ukrainians saw them as proof of Judeo-Bolshevism. Ukrainians saw Poles in extermination battalions as Soviet collaborators. Poles saw this as revenge for the massacres of their own UPA forces. Ninth, within the larger historical context, the study of local genocide sheds a critical light on recent work that is tended to portray Eastern Europe as a whole as the victim of two titanic and evil external forces, Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany. For once we look in more detail into events on the local level, we quickly realize that much of the violence was the product of local dynamics, at times serving the interests of one or the other external invader, and at other times quite independent of them. Hence, while the Soviets and the Germans would have tried to pursue their own goals in any case, the manner in which they did so and the extent of their success depended on the local scene. In the Chortkov Buchach region, for instance, the 20 odd members of the Zippo outpost charged with mur murdering 60,000 Jews would have been hard put to accomplish this task so swiftly without ample local collaboration, both in the form of police detachments and because widespread hostility and resentment toward Jews made it exceedingly difficult to evade the perpetrators. Tenth, this also implies that by examining local events from below, below historically, we are in fact providing the basis for rewriting the history of the Holocaust as a whole, since Buchat stands for hundreds of towns and cities throughout the vast swath 
of Europe's eastern borderlands, from the Baltics to the Balkans. By shifting our gaze from the top and the center, from the perspective of the decision makers and bureaucrats of the final solution, we come much closer to the reality of genocide on the ground in all its gruesome detail, but also in all its human complexity and malleability. We also come to understand that while the Holocaust was unique in certain respects, especially its modern bureaucratic organization, logistical apparatus, and extermination facilities, in other respects, it resembled many other genocides, both before and after World War II, where governmental forces and agencies combined with local elements to produce extensive killing by long-term neighbors. It was precisely the intimate nature of the genocide that contributed to the ubiquity of gratuitous violence, as those who had known each other for generations strove to eradicate the humanity of their victims even before they killed them. Finally, what the study of such local genocides ought to teach us is that the sense of security that many of us enjoy and expect in our own neighborhood and the vast distance we perceive between our current existence and that of the populations of Eastern Europe in World War II or other sites of communal genocide may well be questioned. For this perception of security is founded on nothing more than a thin crust of social order and respect for the law that can easily be shattered. Once we identify certain groups within our midst or on our borders as being outside the bounds of human solidarity, once we direct the forces of law and order against those marked for discrimination, isolation, incarceration, expulsion, or death, we are no longer bystanders, but actively participating in the dismantling of the order on which we rely. To be sure, we wish to exclude ourselves from such identifications. Yet if and when we too become targets of the state and its agencies, we have nothing to fall back on. For the thin crust of security in which we trust is merely based on our internalized sense that we can always ultimately rely on the state apparatus to protect us from each other. One night, upon hearing a suspicious noise outside our door, we call the police. But when the police arrive, they arrest us. At that instant, we realize that this whole apparatus, while still perfectly in place, can be turned against us, as so many black citizens of the United States, for instance, have long known, and I should say many Palestinians have discovered over years of occupation. From this point on, it is only a matter of time before one of our neighbors, who has previously always said hello to us when we return from work, will break into our home wielding an axe and demand our property. Once the social fabric that ties us together begins to fray, there is no telling where it may end up. What occurred in Buchach could serve as a warning. Thank you.